Brother Wade and, and his whole crew have been working hard. We have some wonderful um, Christmas, uh, Christmas, some wonderful Easter music uh, that we're about to share with you all as a form of praise and worship. And um, just good to be here today. I've been looking forward to it for so long. And I know many of you have family and friends that are here today. It's just a wonderful day as Christians around the globe celebrate the fact of the empty tomb that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ rose again. And he rose again physically, he rose again bodily. And that is so important. And the bottom line is the miracle of the resurrection is the foundation for everything that you and I believe. If Jesus did not rise again from the grave, then it's all for not. It's all in vain. The miracle of the resurrection, the doctrine of the resurrection, is, is everything. It is everything that you and I uh, believe as Christians. And so, uh, of course, the white robe represents the victory over death, the victory over sin, and that Jesus Christ is alive. And so we just rejoice um, in that today. And we're so glad that each and every one of you are here today. Before I pray, let me just mention a couple quick things. After the morning service, we want to invite all the children uh, from birth to fifth, sixth grade. If, if you're an eighth or ninth grader and you want to pretend to be a fifth grader, I don't care. Um, but all the children, we're going to march down to the daycare playground. It's uh, to my right, to your left, across the street from the uh, Methodist Church. In fact, I've been uh, the pastor for probably over a month. And um, I'm driving down uh, Trent Street and looked to my left and I thought, man, that, that is a really, that's a really nice uh, playground. I, I, I assume that it belongs to the Methodist Church. Uh, and I looked at Trent Street Daycare. I said, oh, the church owns this. What, what else does Trent Street own? I mean, I said, they own the whole block, amen. And uh, so I, I, it was way after I had been here for a while that I put two and two together that uh, the church owns that playground. It's used primarily for our, our daycare. So after the morning service, we want to invite all the young people to uh, head down the street, be careful crossing the street. And I don't know, there's probably 14 billion Easter eggs hidden, I, something like that, okay? So everybody's going to get uh, plenty of Easter eggs, and we look forward um, to that. You may have noticed there's some envelopes on the pews. Now, hear me, hear me well. Um, anything that comes in these white and blue envelopes, Trent Street will not keep. Every single penny will be sent uh, to Alpharetta, Georgia. That's the home base of our North American Mission Board. And so every Easter, um, Southern Baptist churches across the country uh, collect a special missions offering at, at Easter time. And all of that is used for uh, mission work here in uh, the U.S. and in Canada, North America. And as you well know, the nations are coming to North America. And um, so if you so feel led to give uh, anything, uh, if you'll put it in that envelope, and there's a couple offering boxes um, as you exit, and um, we would be uh, thankful for that and appreciative. And just, I just want you to know that all of it will go towards getting the gospel out here in North America. And um, we as Baptists, you know, we have bulletins and newsletters, and we put things up on the screen, but it's still sometimes hard to keep up with everything that's going on. And so uh, avail yourself this morning to the morning bulletin, and there's announcements, and we'd sure love for you to come back next Sunday if you don't have a home church. And um, I'm going to be preaching on the Great Commission, Acts 1-8, next week. And then I think we're going to tackle the, the uh, simple little epistle from Paul to the church of Galatia, the book of Galatians. And it's going to be a great study. You know, as Baptists, we normally have our doctrine down straight. And we believe the book uh, and the blood and the blessed hope. We have our structure and our doctrine down straight. But sometimes we kind of struggle when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit. And we kind of struggle when it comes to putting in practice the gospel. So that's what Galatians is all about. It's not just gospel doctrine, y'all with me, but gospel culture. And that's what we'll be talking about for several weeks, is how to have a gospel culture uh, in our churches. So come back. We have Sunday school at 10 o'clock. We have church uh, worship service every week at 11 a.m. And we'd love for you to come back and be with us. There's also a little tear-off guest card on your morning bulletin. We'd love to have a record of your worship with us this morning. If there's a prayer request or a need or you need a phone call from the pastor or from a deacon or anything that we can do to help, if you'll just um, give us that information. And again, you can just uh, drop those guest cards off in the offering boxes on your way out and uh, our uh, deacons will make sure we get those and we will pray over them and we'll do whatever we can uh, to minister to you. Um, there's a list of names in the morning bulletin and uh, so pray for these folks. And next Sunday morning, we'll have a vote of affirmation uh, for the congregation to approve um, our uh, student minister search committee. So the, the three ladies and three men, their names are listed in the bulletin. So pray over those and pray for them. And uh, next Sunday morning, we'll have a vote of affirmation. 
And, uh, but it's not just, you know, vote and they go do all the work. We need to pray for them. And we all need to be praying, Lord, send us the right uh, person, the right couple to come and lead our students. You know, children and students are so important because most people who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they do that um, normally before age 14, specifically before age 18. And so it's so important to have uh, ministries for that age group, and I'm thankful that Trent Street does that. Hey, join me in prayer this morning as we continue to worship, please. Uh, Father in heaven, we just thank you. We can gather this morning. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your presence. Father, we thank you for the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, as Easter is the most holy of holy days. For the Old Testament Hebrew, it was the Passover. That dreadful night in Egypt when the death angel came and took the life of every firstborn. The only exception were those in their homes that had put the Passover lamb's blood on the door, on the sides, on the mantle. Father, we're thankful for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who came as the ultimate Passover lamb. <clears throat> May each and every one of us look in our hearts this morning and ask the question, has the blood been applied? Has the blood been been applied. The life of the flesh is in the blood. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of the blood of that perfect, blameless Lamb of God. Father, we thank you that almost halfway around the world today and outside the city gates of Jerusalem, there at a place called Galgotha. <coughs> the place of the skull. The tomb is empty. But our Savior lives again. So we come to you today humbly, Lord, and we praise you and give you the glory. Father, it's all about you. Father, remind me, remind us that the Son, S O N, is the true center of the universe be the center of our lives, that you've called us to be disciples, you've called us to be followers, and we'll be careful to give you all the glory and all the praise, in Jesus' name. The lifeless body of Jesus Christ was taken from the cross and wrapped in fresh linen. He was laid in a new stone tomb, and a large rock was moved to seal the entrance. The day that had begun the crowd screaming for an execution would finally end at a silent grave. The next day must have gone gray and sunless. How can we imagine the hopelessness of that Saturday? How can we fathom the despair of faith that has died? Jesus' followers were either immobilized by grief or hiding in fear. His accusers rushed to seal the tomb more securely. And on that second day, death appeared to have claimed the final victory. What would our world have become if it had all ended that day? What if Sunday had never come? Suppose the stone had never stood, death had had the final word. What if the voices of darkness there had won? What if Christ was not alive and every hope had been denied? Where would we be if Sunday had not come? Oh, what if Sunday had not come, what if the sun 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir. You're about to see a miracle in the Baptist Church. It's going to be called a short message. Amen. John chapter 20. By the way, y'all do know that Baptist preachers preach faster, get done sooner when they have a little bit of amens. Amen. Amen. And smiley faces. And hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> I think. John chapter 20. Listen, how in the world do you preach an Easter message? I, I don't know how to do it because everybody knows how the story ends, and that's okay. It's an opportunity to remind ourselves one more time of his great uh, sacrifice, the Son of God, the one and only Son of God. Of course, you know the drill, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels. They give us all the life of Christ from four different perspectives, and the last several weeks, with the exception of one, I've stuck with the book of John, so I'm going to do that again today. We've looked at the seeking servant and the serving servant, the silent servant, and the sacrificing Savior and servant, and now our saving servant, or our saving Savior, if you will, in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. And just by way of, <coughs> excuse me, introduction, if, uh, if uh, you do any kind of social media, I know I'm an old fogey, kind of Facebook's my thing, I don't do the other ones, I like the young people do, but you'll see all kinds of great quotes and testimonies and and verses of the scripture that are just as a blessing. I began to think of all these short, uh, short verses and short quotes. And then I want to look at John chapter 20 and just kind of walk through it. And then um, you'll see the, the conclusion here in just a moment. But uh, yeah, I think uh, the very, very first verse here now, uh, early on the first day of the week, uh, they, the women came first. I think that's amazing. And, and the tomb is empty. And uh, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Uh, we talk about. Um, a lot can happen in just three days. Uh, there's all kinds of great little sayings and quotes and the death of Christ and Silent Saturday and then the sunrise S-O-N uh, on uh, Resurrection Day. That's what this day is. Uh, Dr. Randall O'Brien, former uh, president of First and Newman, he put on Facebook, the sun S-O-N has risen. That's about as simple uh, as you can put it. There's an old time uh, uh, African-American pastor of yesteryear. You can go home this afternoon. You can Google him. His name was S.M. Lockridge. S.M. Lockridge. He's very well known. He had a great uh, message called, That's My Jesus. Go home and, and Google that. And it, it's about five minutes long on that particular part. That's My Jesus. It will fire you up. S.M. Lockridge. What does the S.M. stand for? Shadrach Meshach. I'm not making that up. I mean, You've got to be a preacher if your name is Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. And he is well known for saying, it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. Not coming, it's coming, amen. It's Friday, but Sunday is coming. The greatest day in all of human history, the focal point of human history, when God in his wisdom and sovereignty sent his only begotten son to be that sacrificial lamb, to provide that way of salvation for you and I, to be the provision for our sin debt, to cover our sins, if you will, to give us the cure to a lethal disease called sin. And so the fourth account here in the Gospel of John, uh, some folks will probably go all the way through verse 18. I'm not going to do that. I just want to walk through verses 1 through 10. John chapter 20 is all about his appearances after his resurrection. First, uh, first Corinthians 15, there's 58 verses. That's called the resurrection chapter. The, the early part of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul goes through a list of people who physically saw Jesus after his resurrection. It's very important that he had a bodily, physical resurrection to fulfill his promise. He wasn't a ghost. He came back after his resurrection in the flesh. In fact, on more than one occasion, he actually ate food. That gives us hope, right, as Baptists, that there's going to be food in heaven, amen? Jesus, in his resurrected body, ate food. He did. And so, all in John chapter 20, you have all of these accounts of his appearance. So, uh, they come to the tomb in verses 1 through um, 9, and it's empty. We'll see that here in just a moment. But then he, he appears um, to the, the ladies, he uh, appears to the disciples, and then the latter part of chapter 20, he appears to that last disciple, Doubting Thomas. Thomas wasn't there on that first evening of the resurrection, but eight days later on that first day of the week, the Sunday night, if you will, 
um, Thomas shows up and he'd already said, I won't believe until I see the nail prints in his hands, the scar in his side. He's known as Doubting Thomas. He, he demanded physical proof. But the latter part of chapter 20, uh, Jesus says, Hey, Thomas, you believe because you physically saw me. But blessed are those who believe without ever physically seeing me. That, that, that's you and I, the church age. That's you and I 2,000 years later. So John chapter 20, verse 1. Let's just walk through it. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Every verse of scripture is jam-packed with theology, with practicality, with application. It was dark. Oh yeah, it was dark all right. It was spiritually dark. And before you and I came to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, our spiritual eyes were very dark. The world is dark with sin and violence and trouble, tribulation. Very dark. Mary Magdalene comes before the sun, physical sun comes up. She comes early. Why does she come? She's coming to bring more spices to anoint the physical body of who she believes to be a dead Jesus. They did not embalm 2,000 years ago in the Hebrew custom. They wrapped that body in linen cloth. As you read the passage, you find out there's, there's a separate cloth for his head. She comes and she sees that the tomb is empty. Where have they taken my Savior? What has happened? She may have thought of several things. One commentator said maybe she thought that she had come to the wrong tomb. Uh, maybe the government had moved his body. Maybe somebody had come and stolen his body. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is the other disciple that Jesus loved? That's John. That's the author of the Gospel of John. Peter, James, and John, the three disciples closest to our Lord in his earthly ministry. So do you see all the action? Luke does this too, and I think Matthew does too. There's all this action taking place in the resurrection narrative. Man, people are looking, people are running, people are discovering, people are on the move. She runs, she's, she's what has happened to my Lord? What, what's going on here? And she comes upon the disciples and, and she explain, explains uh, what she has seen or not seen. And immediately uh, the disciples that Jesus loved, uh, that would be John and Simon and Peter, of course, they begin a foot race. They're, they're running to go and find out what is going on at this tomb, this, this so-called empty tomb. She came and, and she said, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran. Peter and John are having a foot race. And the other disciple outran Peter. John outruns Peter. But it's very interesting how the events take place in these verses. And, and um, came to the tomb first. John is the first one to arrive. John, he's stooping down. He, he looks inside. He sees the linen cloths lying there. Yet John did not go in. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was going to steal a dead body in the middle of the night, I, I wouldn't take the time to unwrap it. The linen cloths are, are all laying there. And the handkerchief, the New King James says in verse 7, this is the head covering. It's laying there and it's folded. It doesn't look like there's any foul play. Nobody's been in a big hurry here. It's not things strode everywhere. It's kind of organized. As if a body had come out of those grave clothes and just peaceably laid them there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, verse 7, not lying with the linen cloths, but folds together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and he believed. So John gets there first, doesn't go in. Peter goes in. John, then he enters in verse 8. And he saw, church, and that last word. And he saw, not only did he physically see with his eyes, but the Bible says he believed. And that's all the difference. He, listen, even the devil, even the enemy, even fallen demons believe in Jesus intellectually. But see here, John, he goes in and he, and he discovers the tomb is empty, except for the grave clothes. He looks around and John believed. That is, not, that is intellectual, that is emotional, but that is mostly volitional. In his will, he believes that Jesus has risen from the grave. Verse 9, 
for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now church, when I read that, I was baffled because Jesus told them several times that he must die. So I'm going to raise this temple up in three days. He wasn't talking about a physical temple. He's talking about the temple of his body. Commentators say that this is a direct quote, and I'm going to turn there to Psalm 16 and verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, or the abode of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. That, listen, don't feel bad because even the disciples that had had an earthly ministry with Jesus, they were still trying to figure it all out. Is he who he said he was? They're confused. There's a sense of confusion there. They're still trying to connect the dots, put the puzzle together, if you will. And there in John chapter 20, in verse 8, he sees and he believes. For as yet they did not know, or they did not understand. They didn't completely understand the scripture, the Old Testament. They didn't really understand all that was happening. And I think verse 10 is almost comical. Then the disciples went away again <clears throat> to their own home. And then throughout the rest of chapter 20 are all of his uh, appearances. And then into chapter um, 21 where he meets the disciples in Galilee. I preached on that just a few weeks ago. For some 40 days, Jesus appeared all over. There were several hundred, if you will, that saw him in his glorified risen body. It's a historical fact, eyewitness account. And then we know in Acts chapter 1, there's the great ascension to the right hand of the Father. I came across something that I want to share one pastor put it this way. I thought this was really good. He said, there are at least ten reasons why Jesus had to die. And I'm just going to read through these. I just dotted them down. Now, we'll go in backwards order, if you will. Number ten, Jesus had to die on the cross and rise again from the grave in order to destroy the hostility between the races. That's pretty good. See, the enemy wants to divide and conquer. We are all made in God's image. I've had the privilege, and some of you have too, to be on a few foreign trips and foreign mission trips. And we are all made in God's image. We may have different skin tone, we may have different cultures, we may have different languages. We may have different traditions. But I love the preschool song, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. See, in Jesus Christ, in Christ and Christ alone, he brings us together. Christ doesn't divide. Christ unifies. People from around the globe have one thing in common as the followers of Jesus, and that's Jesus himself and salvation. So in his death, he brings reconciliation amongst the peoples of the planet. Number nine, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you find this in Ephesians chapter 5, brings us the deepest meaning of marriage. Marriage is not something that man designed. Marriage is an idea that came from God. Married, marriage is, God designed marriage in Genesis 1 and 2 between a man and a woman. As a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ, the, 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 the groom, and his love for the bride, you and I as the church. The fullest need of marriage comes about when we recognize the death, burial, resurrection, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Number eight, his, his sacrifice on the cross absorbs the wrath of God. I don't like it and I can't explain everything, but because of our sin... There is a penalty, and death is that penalty. Uh, God is a God of love and grace, but he's also a God of justice and righteousness. And there has to be a penalty applied for our unrighteousness. And Jesus, think about this, in those few hours, listen, in those few hours on the cross, Jesus physically, if you will, took on all of our sin and all the sins of humankind for all ages. All of that guilt, all of that shame rests upon his shoulders while he hung on the cross. The wrath of the Father was upon the Son. Number seven, only through his finished work could you and I escape the curse of the law. You may have caught it last night. So long I didn't catch it all. I've seen it as a child. The Ten Commandments. The Passover was a picture of the coming of the Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ. And so the Old Testament had that law, but nobody can keep the law. And the law has that curse, curse of death. And number six, through his sacrifice, we are reconciled to God. That God commends his love toward us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So number five, we see the love of God. Number four, we see the love of Christ. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. All of John, all of 1 John, all of the Bible is about the love and the mercy of God. That he loves us and made us and wants to have a relationship with us through his son. Number three, to take away our condemnation. Yes, we are condemned. We are in a court of law and we are found guilty because we are guilty. Every single one of us in some fashion has broken at least one, if not all, ten of the Ten Commandments. In one form or fashion, we stand guilty before a holy judge. We are condemned. But Christ took our punishment, took our penalty, has purchased our pardon, purchased our freedom. Number two, to bring us to God. There again, that wonderful word. I love this word. It just sounds good in the English language. Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Two folks are at odds. There's two, two countries are enemies. Two neighbors don't like each other. Two brothers are at odds with each other. There's a wall. There's a division. But through Christ and Christ alone, there can be that reconciliation. We can be reconciled to a righteous God through the suffering of his son. And then, of course, number one, to give us eternal life. To all who do what? What John did. To all who believe. Salvation is like a two-sided coin. It's so simple. On one side is faith. On the other side is belief, trust. We put our faith and our trust in Him for salvation. You know, I may not know you or know your story, but God does. And whether you're a, a young person or a senior adult, a college student, a widow, Jesus loves you. Jesus created you in His image. And he, he wants to have a relationship with you. But the only way is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the one thing I read in the last week or so that really got my attention was so simple, so short. And it basically goes like this. The, the miracle of salvation is not so much that we accept Jesus, but that Jesus accepts us. I mean, he's a he, this. Mm, he's he, he's he, he he's he's bidding you to come. He's calling you. He's offering you salvation. But it's a it's a personal decision you, in your heart. In your listen, it does include the mind. Okay, it does. It does include the emotions. But sometimes we forget. Ultimately, it's our choice, our will, our volition. Okay. You don't have to understand everything. I certainly don't understand everything. I just know that there is a God. He created me. I've fallen short of his glory. And when I was a 14-year-old boy at a Monday night revival meeting, the Holy Spirit convicted me, spoke to me, not in an audible voice, but I, mean, I, I could feel the pressure, if you will, of the Holy Spirit convicting me. And I just simply put my faith in the risen Lord. And the Bible says you must be born again. Folks, it's, it's, it's just that simple. It's just that. In fact, it's so simple, some people stumble over it. So, again, wherever you may be in your faith walk, wherever you may be in your faith journey, it starts with a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you've never done that, I would urge you to do that today. Here in a few moments, we're going to give an old-fashioned Baptist uh, invitation. And I, I want to ask some of, our, some of our ladies and some of our men and some of our deacons and staff, if you feel led to come and, and help us at the invitation. Um, if, if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, there's, there's Bibles here up front. Um, there's, there's gospel material here up front. And we just, listen, we're, we're, not, we're not trying to pressure anybody. We're not trying to sell anything. Just wanna, we want to offer you the sweet salvation that we've experienced, that you can experience through the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and you know Christ as your Savior. But for whatever reason it may be, you, you've never followed in the first step of Christian obedience, which is baptism. Baptism doesn't save us. Baptism doesn't wash our sins away. Only the blood of Christ can do that. But baptism is the outward expression of the inward decision that we've made in Christ. Baptism is vital. It's important. So um, if you're thinking about following in baptism, I'd be glad to talk with you during the invitation this morning or after the service. Uh, maybe you've uh, been around for a long time, or maybe you're new to the area and you're, you're looking for a church home. You, you know the Lord, you've been born again. You say, well, how do you join a, a Baptist church? Well, um, you can join upon your baptism if you've not been baptized. 
uh, if you're a member of another Southern Baptist church, we have a thing where we call a transfer of letter, where our clerk contacts that church clerk, and we transfer your membership letter to Trenton Street. Or um, if your background is of, an, of another denomination or whatnot, we have what's called joining a Baptist church by statement of faith. Where you just basically declare, I know Christ is my Savior, I've been baptized, and I want to unite with this local assembly. Well, why do that? Because church membership is important. Having a family is important. Probably most of us um, are going to go here in a few moments and spend time with our extended family. Okay? So everybody needs a church family where we, where we can grow and use our spiritual gifts and be involved in kingdom work. Listen, we're, we're, we're meant for community. We had communion last Sunday. Everybody needs a church home. Everybody needs a place where they belong and where they can grow spiritually and that they can be involved in, in Christian ministry. So uh, salvation, first step of obedience, baptism, church membership, rededication. I don't know, maybe God's calling somebody here today and, and you don't have to be 17, you might be 70 or 77. You know, maybe God's calling you to, to missions. Maybe he's calling you to some kind of Christian service. Maybe, maybe today you feel like, Hey, I know Jesus, I have a relationship with him, but I, you know, I just, he, Jesus feels so far away. Yeah, that happens to all of us. We can be born again, heaven's our home, we know we're saved, but it can be like Jesus is far away. And sometimes it does us good to come to an old-fashioned altar and just renew that commitment to Christ. Ask him to forgive us for our sin, for our neglect of our relationship with him. Uh, and if you're not physically able to kneel at, a, at the altar, that's okay. There's, there's a front pew here. You say, well, what would people think? I, I don't mean to be blunt on Easter, but who cares what people think? Jesus hung naked, basically, on an old rugged cross publicly. And if, if he could do that for us, surely we can proclaim his name. You know, and you say, well, I, I, I'm new, and you know, I don't know about this coming forward type of stuff. Listen, I promise you, you ask the person next to you, grab their hand, I promise you that they'll come forward too, okay? He will, they will, he or she will. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the beautiful music that we've enjoyed this morning and our heart have been served. But Lord, I pray right now that the simple truth of the death, burial, and resurrection of the gospel would penetrate our hearts. There may be a young person, a child, a teenager, a student, a college student. Lord, that they just need to do business with you. In fact, Lord, everybody, including the preacher, we need to do business with you today. We need to be renewed in our faith. We need to be recommitted to the cause of Christ. We need to be encouraged today that the tomb is empty, that our faith is alive, our faith is not dead. So Father, I pray that we'll not just come to another Sunday morning Easter service and check that off of our list, but Lord, that we will be obedient and allow the Holy Spirit to stir our heart to speak to us that we might be your disciples, that we might be committed followers of Jesus Christ, people of the way, that we will believe the message. Stir us, Lord, change us, Lord. Your will be done in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing an old-fashioned hymn. I'll be down front, and, and uh, let's see, DeMarcus wants to come, and Kevin, y'all want to come, some others want to come, and just pray here at the altar and help us with those that are going to come today. If you don't know Christ, you come, you come as we sing.
invitation is still open. The altar is still open. You come. If you're out there in the pew today or watching by way of the internet and you don't know Christ as your Savior, the sinner's prayer is not magical. It's not a trick. The prayer doesn't save anybody. It's our faith and our trust. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. My dear friend, you can pray a simple prayer, something like this. You can pray it now. You can pray it silently. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, that I have broken your law. And I believe today that Jesus Christ is your son. that he died, was buried, and rose again for my sin, defeated death in the grave. And the best way I know how, I'm asking Jesus Christ to be my Savior and take control of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Help me to live for you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. My dear friend, if you will, in faith, just simply pray and ask God to save you. Peter said, Jesus, save me. It's so simple. Even a child can understand it. Maybe there's another decision, a recommitment that you need to make today. We're going to sing one more verse. This verse is for you. Jesus was never ashamed of you. If you're not ashamed of him, if you just prayed that prayer and gave your life to Christ, I'm not going to ask you to speak. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I sure would be thankful if you would just come and take me by the hand and say, Preacher, I just prayed that prayer and I gave my life to Christ. Or maybe you'd like to know more about the Christian life. Well, the way it's going to come, we're going to sing another hymn, another verse, and this verse is for you. You come. We have one more song as we begin to prepare to, to depart today. Listen, take Jesus with you. Share Jesus. There's gospel tracts in the foyer. If Trent Street or myself can help you in any way, that's why we're here. That's why we're here, to be the family of God, to, to pray for each other, support each other, love for each other. Uh, uh, this is a sanctuary. It's set apart. It's a safe place. It's a special place. Listen, you, you can come here anytime. Be loved and be, be accepted. Well, preacher, you don't know what I've done. No, you don't know what I've done, amen. Uh, we don't want to know, but Jesus knows. And he forgives. And look, woo, isn't God good? Isn't God good? He's the God of the second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance. Man, Jesus pursues us. He wants us. So we're going to sing, and after we sing, uh, or they sing, we're going to be dismissed. Kids, we'll meet you down at the playground. Precious blood. 
so poured out to cleanse my soul and let his living glory flow because it lives to make me Precious blood that gave.